iterations of the plan. Um, the yellow one was kind of leading up to schematic. The black and white was our, um, our SD. And now um, you'll see one that starts to have the tone and recognizable pews that, that you're all sitting in. And that's the, the current plan as, as we have it now. <clears throat> the other big part of the development was the, was the corner, um, the kind of expressive corner of the building and of the chapel. Um, the massing of this project, um, while the individual's rooms were shifting, had always stayed um, pretty consistent in terms of the way Craig described as sort of smoothing over disparate uses and trying to make um, the beacon, the singular um, element out of that. Um, and so the, the transition of the corner from um, square to rounded at the top um, was there from very early on, um, although at the point of SD we were still sort of testing out various ideas of what material we might use to um, actually achieve that. Yeah, we did, we did, we're not showing these, but we did a scheme with um, precast concrete. Um, it was determined by, the, by our um, construction managers that all of the precast concrete companies were so far backed up because of the Little Caesars Arena that we couldn't get on anyone's list, um, so that went away. Uh, we looked at GFR, G GFRC as a, a series of cast panels um, in, at a different scale than the precast. Um, that kind of got lost along the, the way somewhere. And then um, ultimately we settled on brick as a, as a way to begin to work. And uh, a couple of ways that we began to work between the kind of digital model, between a way of beginning to um, to design the brick and think about the distortions and the geometry which were there from, for, uh, as Jen said, from early on. And were interestingly like fought for by the design committee because for them, like the curvature of the wall or the curvature of the kind of base of the chapel made it stand apart from the existing uh, rectilinear box of the building. And they really didn't want this chapel to in any way blend in with the existing even though we were trying to work contextually and borrow the cross and kind of develop it, it wanted, they wanted, and we wanted it to be a kind of unique figure. And so the corner, this kind of important corner is um, basically that corner. Uh, and it's the position of the tabernacle and the plan. And the interesting thing, and we'll, we'll talk about this uh, again um, when we talk talking about the ceiling, but there's a tension between um, this space as a church it's not a church, it's a chapel. It's designed for people to, I think that was actually me. Um, it's designed for um, people to just come in at any time. Uh, there's a mass once a day, it's at 6 a.m. Uh, and the tabernacle, um, which is where the, the Eucharist is held, is used throughout the day by lay ministers who are taking the Eucharist to the sick uh, who can't come down to the chapel for the mass. And so that becomes a, a, for the nuns, that's more important than the altar, which is like the site of the, the ritual of the mass. And so the tension between these two things sets up a kind of interesting kind of um, relationship in here. So we wanted that kind of verticality and height to grab there. And then it also gave us the opportunity to grab a little piece of Southern light by pulling that corner further over to give us the dichroic window. But developing that corner, and I'll we'll talk about the outside of it because it's, it's really a kind of, um, it was a tricky process both in the geometry of it, but also a really um, incredible and awesome experience of working with a group of unbelievably talented Masons um, who were uh, in it from day one. They, they saw the design and they completely were like, we want this, we want this job. Um, so it was, uh, a pretty great thing to get them on board. So the, the owner of the company and the head mason came to our office and um, we're showing them the drawings and they're looking at it and they're scratching their heads and they're not quite getting it. And then we pulled up that wooden model that you saw, which is about this tall and it's every brick of that corner made out of basswood uh, stacked up. And the head mason, um, their, their head guy, Mike Piazza, was just like, oh, we can totally do that. <laughs> you know? And it was like this great moment um, where you're, you're, you're kind of, like you see the kind of um, the difficulty of what it's going to be, and then you see the kind of moment that's a challenge, and a craftsman kind of taking that on as a kind of way forward. And so we developed the drawings um, through a kind of back and forth dialogue with them about what we were after. So as we're wrapping the brick around the corner, it's conical. So every course of brick is a different length uh, if you stretch the, the rows of brick out, because it goes from the right angle to a soft curve at the top. 
So every single course is, is different and it all resolves at a straight line back here and a straight line uh, up at the top of this window. And the decision was like, we don't want to cut any bricks at those moments because we'll end up with some little slivers or some big fat joints. And, um, and so there's a whole process that we went through with them, both in our, um, our process of developing a grasshopper model that populated the wall of brick for us and worked on the angles. <laughs> but then uh, kind of going in and massaging uh, specific areas uh, in the model um, where we're expanding the mortar joint just a little bit um, to nudge it, or we're tightening the joint a little bit to kind of shrink it to get the final resolution point in line. And it was a really kind of remarkable moment because it was one where the digital got us to a certain point, but it kind of wouldn't get us to that last hurdle. We had to go back in and start to begin to develop by hand through the kind of constraints and, and issues that we were putting on it. And so the digital corner <coughs> studies that you saw early on there, the color coding has to do with that. It has to do with coding the rotation of the bricks, and it also has to do with coding um, the different spacing um, layers of, of the joints of the brick. And the digital model was one of the things that we used to communicate back and forth with Davenport. We shared a model with them. Um, they rebuilt their own digital model and shared it with us. And there was some kind of comparison and overlap there to see um, if everybody was using similar logics to build that corner. <clears throat> and the, the basic um, premise that we brought to the, to the development of this corner and the patterning of the brick uh, was to simply let the brick happen. Uh, so as, the, as it turns the corner, we just said we'll delay the rotation of the brick just slightly. And so it's, it's starting to pop out a little bit as it goes around the corner in sawtooth. And then in the opposite, the next course, we would do that in the opposite direction. So the course, the brick starts to make a kind of brick weave in the pattern, but it's there just as a kind of result of the geometry interacting with the brick itself. Um, and that was important for us because we wanted to articulate it as a presence on the facade, given how few windows there are because it's such an internally oriented space, the kind of um, hospital chapel as a kind of inside, uh, and only the couple of windows that would look to the garden, the dichroic window, and then a window to the east uh, that in that morning mass brings light down onto the altar. The, the wall itself needed to have a kind of presence and character um, that was important. And so one of the maybe even more challenging aspects of the corner um, had to do with the framing and the structure of the corner. Um, not necessarily just the, um, the steel structure underneath, but the, um, the secondary la layer of studs as well to form um, the basis from which the masons would work um, because there's also a tilt to it. So um, sort of measuring where you are in space on that corner becomes quite a bit of a challenge. Um, so there was also a lot of back and forth process in terms of us sharing our models um, with the structural, um, uh, with yeah. the steel uh, engineers and then them sharing back. Um, what you'll see in a moment is a kind of layering of those two models together again so that we could kind of see overlaps and see yeah. where things were or weren't lining up in order to coordinate that with um, the kind of models that the masons were working on. So there are three drawings in that image. One, one is the Rhino model of our project, uh, our Rhino model. There's a model that's imported from the steel fabricator from Douglas, uh, who are just outside of Lansing. And then there's a CAD drawing of our wall section, all matching up to make sure that there's a kind of precision and alignment of all of those pieces. Because the last thing we wanted to do was get that frame up and then start bricking and that piece of steel is kind of a little bit too far out and now we got a whole another thing to worry about. And then this image is also, this is, this is our skin and shell model um, with the steel model uh, from, that was produced by Douglas inserted inside it. So we were looking at uh, beginning to measure conflicts um, uh, within the, the kind of resolution of these two pieces. And there you're starting to see now a sequence of images which we'll just let kind of play a little bit, but this is a sequence of the construction of that corner from beginning from the steel frame to the, to the steel studs which are making the, the kind of larger surface as a ruled surface wrapping that corner. Uh, to the waterproofing and sheathing, to the insulation, uh, and then you'll start to see some of the brickwork going into place. Um, and the, when the, you'll get there in a second. We did a few quickly. Um, the brickwork is, um, like this was the other kind of amazing thing of working with um, Davenports. We were ready, to, we, we actually printed a number of full scale, um, plotted some templates of some of the brick coursing and thought that, that they thought at one point they would cut out some plywood molds maybe every fifth or sixth course and then they could reconcile in between. 
And in the end, they decided that, that they could just, Mike just felt like they could do it. Um, and so what he developed was a method of running vertical strings, and those vertical strings are grabbing the point of each brick that's rotating. So the masons are really still placing by hand. They're, they're working in a way that um, is calibrated and careful, but giving themselves, I think, a really interesting set of line work that they're beginning to develop. And then when we got to the larger corner, um, we had a Rhino model. Uh, we, we developed a model that they could import onto their iPads that they could turn off every layer of coursing. And so they were basically building the Rhino model one layer at a time as they're going up the course and kind of checking and working on that. And I think you're seeing an image of Mike with the iPad there on site. Um, and then the corner like, is really interesting. So the, the, those vertical strings on, the, on this corner of the building under this window, they're all simply straight strings. Um, uh, on, when it gets to the conical corner, the, the joints and the points of the brick are actually starting to wrap around. So he was, every day, he would reset his strings, uh, mapping that corner around. And they did a pretty amazing job. But the other challenge of that corner is that a lot of it has to do with um, just its direct visual impact. And it was a little bit frustrating both for them and for us is that we couldn't see it during the process because they're built a scaffold up along it. So we're always getting these kind of small glimpses and we're noticing points where the, it's a little too flat, like they're, the strings are kind of a little not quite exactly right. So it's flattening out a little bit too, too quickly or it's a little too peaked in places. And Mike was just like, go away, go away. <laughs> Get out of here, we're, we'll fix it. We'll, we'll come back and fix it, but we need to get to the top and then we can pull the scaffold off and see it and we can come back and start to make adjustments. And they did, it was totally amazing. So we sat out there, we were, uh, Taka was there every day while they were doing the, uh, the, the, uh, this corner. He was showing up on site and they were working through it. Um, uh, we, we thought they were gonna let Taka lay a few of the bricks, but in the end they <laughs> never did. Uh, but Taka, I think, really became a kind of mason uh, through the project as well. And that corner kind of pulls off what we were after, which is like it starts to produce a kind of visual density right as it starts to round and model. Uh, and coupled with the kind of lower corner and the upper corner, um, it, it makes this kind of interesting dynamic across the facade that we were after. Uh, and you're seeing just some images of the, of the final brickwork. Uh, or as it's finishing uh, in process. The other thing we, that, that's really nice is I think it takes advantage of the iron spot um, brick and that every angle of the brick is grabbing a little bit of a different angle of sunlight or reflection. And so over any moment of the surface, it's changing in its color and its reflectivity and um, really beginning to produce some of the kind of atmospheric qualities that we were after. Everybody, is everybody stuck right now or some recycling? Okay, You're that's cool. Nice. You guys are ahead of Carl. Yeah, <laughs> they put some scaffolding back up Thank and you. then they, bought, they took out a couple of big sections and then just redid it within it. I mean, we were freaking out when we started to see that crease in the corner start to emerge and then there's a little flat spot and we're like, they're way past it already before we caught it and it was just like, oh. They fixed uh, it, they were amazing. Yeah. Uh, I got all of the gray is from <laughs> the last 19 months. From the brick. <laughs> and the door, which we'll finish on. <laughs> so we're going to take you to the inside, um, from the outside, mm -hmm. and, um, and recalibrate a little bit through, um, through a diagram that we started thinking about um, probably earlier in the schematic orientation and, and redevelopment of the plans. Um, we really started thinking about um, how the different religions um, organize space and, um, um, and orientation. And so in the chapel, there's a very strong axis and everybody's oriented along that axis. In the Muslim prayer space, um, it's more of a field of people oriented to one very particular angle. Um, and we were also asked to deal with this reflection room, which is sort of what people are calling it now for a while. Um, a number of the nuns were really thinking of it as a seeker space, as a space for um, um, folks who maybe were in the Catholic faith and are no longer or aren't sure yet. Um, and so for us, we, 
we wanted to try to identify what its relationship would be also in terms of kind of orientation or uh, relationship to something. Um, so we conceptualized that space as a circle, that somebody would be in relationship to that garden that Craig mentioned before, or, or a tree, or nature. Uh, and so the section um, that's coming up is, is showing a cut through um, the chapel that we are now, a little bit of the um, secret space that's just behind us. And I'm just going to show um, very briefly those other two spaces, um, which we'll try to save enough time um, to visit. The Muslim prayer space is the space that probably changed the most um, through the process, both because of its re relocation, um, but also um, simplification in some of the screening elements. So the ablution space is very much in line with where we started, and it's really the space that got the most um, um, investment in, in materials and detailing because it's, it's kind of the space of transition um, from, from one place, from working or being at the hospital into the space of prayer. And by the time you're in the prayer space itself, you're less focused on the room as much as you're focused on, um, on the act of prayer. Um, and so the image that you're showing originally was a kind of screen, um, a, a double layer of laser cut um, metal that was, was sort of um, interpreting and extending some Islamic tiling patterns um, with a gold layer behind and a white layer in front with the cut out as the Qibla wall. Um, and so that center part is still intact in the room. The rest of it um, um, transitioned into fabric, into curtains in order to reorient that room. And then the secret space um, always had um, a, a, an idea about shifting um, from, the, from the iron spot brick on the outside to something uh, much more colorful and reflective and maybe interior oriented on the inside. Um, and so we found a glazed brick that had a kind of bluish green um, tone to it, um, which really had a lot of resonance to people when we were showing them. A lot of different people from different, different faiths um, found that as a kind of reflective um, color. It, it just really um, uh, resonated with people quickly. So a lot of the development of that room had to do um, with the development of colors and, and, and geometries um, one to the next. And the image is an older version of it um, that also went through a lot of different versions. Um, the current um, format, which you'll see, um, really, um, this is before the, the outside of the chapel um, changed. And when it shifted, it gave us a, uh, an opportunity to get um, the bench spaces much more in a kind of circular uh, relationship with that courtyard. So it, it has a stronger oh, um, visual relationship um, so, now than it did um, uh, earlier on. Yeah. So there's two, two things that are kind of small things, which you'll notice uh, like when we go back outside and, and start to walk around a bit. There's, two, there's a window into that space from the hallway and the window um, is, it has a series of wooden louvers in it that allow you as you're coming uh, down the hallway, moving in this direction, to see through the space uh, into the courtyard. But it shields from view anyone who might be sitting in that space. Because aside from it being a, a kind of seeker space, it was also described as being a place where um, a priest or a doctor um, or um, uh, the hospital staff might be consoling specifically a family, delivering some news, talking over options. Uh, and so it had to also be a kind of protected and shielded space. But we also wanted to pull that light in all the way through to the hallway. And then the, the window that's kind of opposite us right now that's facing the hallway as well is really to, to protect the sound of, um, there's part of the education wing of the, of the hospital uh, that happens in the basement of the, uh, of the old chapel. And there's always a, a kind of run of traffic across there. And those wooden slats are actually all um, aiming your view right to the altar, right through. So they're, they're kind of, um, they're much more subtle because they're almost straight on, but there's a kind of subtle shift that moves across. And then the glass is also repositioning uh, in between those. And it actually cuts down on some of the reflectivity um, of seeing yourself as you walk through. And so the ceiling was another um, important orienting device. And as Craig has already mentioned, the tabernacle holds um, the kind of highest position of importance in the sequence of the, of the hospital. Uh, and so, um, so the, the ceiling allowed us to, um, to have two axes, the kind of main aisle axis, which is marked in the floor and the color of the terrazzo related to the altar, and then um, the pitch and um, the, the seam in the uh, ceiling pointing uh, to the tabernacle. <coughs> and so when you come in, you've got the two axes marked um, together. 
And so the diagram that's up um, was an early one developing to um, essentially cylinders, very large cylinders, um, and finding a way to intersect in order to get um, curvature out of linear elements. So all the wood slats are linear elements, um, and the curvature is attained um, through the um, through the ribbing that the structure that they're they're attached to. Um, uh, there's a lot of work positioning the kind of overall geometry of the cylinders to produce the crease that goes from the tabernacle to this back corner as a diagonal opposition to the front axis of uh, procession straight to the altar. So also it, it allowed the the position of the slats in the ceiling, um, well, to, to make a ruled surface, but also to reorient slightly on their oblique so that you're not looking up between them as you're coming in. And then this one also uh, had a lot of work to get to the point where the ruled surface was also parallel with this wall uh, in order to resolve um, all of the geometries that are coming into play. And then the other one, the, the kind of far one, is oblique and it's getting clipped everywhere. But it also returns once it get, gets around that corner back up over the oblique window. So there was a lot that was going on in here that for us was, um, you know, I hate to say that anything like that it was like we were channeling the Baroque, but we were definitely thinking all the way through that through the, the kind of inspiration of some of those spaces that I showed at the beginning, that the insides and the outsides would not have to match that kind of idea that the outside is beginning to bundle things. But there's also a kind of program of sculpting that happens, both the sculpting of the ceiling and the sculpting of the walls from the niches that define the stations of the cross to the geometries inscribed on the floor that define each of the main liturgical spaces at the front from the, the speaker space, from the presider's chairs, the altar, uh, and the uh, tabernacle itself. And those get inscribed uh, in the surface of the, uh, of the floor. And then the wall is kind of resolving between a kind of reg regular um, kind of geometry as it has to <laughs> kind of come together with the ceiling uh, and sculpting that space uh, in between. So these are all also kind of developed out of a ruled surface um, that's, that's actually made out of uh, a company in Michigan that um, has figured out a top secret patented method of curving drywall, which they won't, they won't explain, but basically, he came to the office and we we're trying to explain to him what he was like, yeah, give me any shape as long as you can make it out of a piece of paper, I can do it. And we're like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> and he made it. And he did it. He so it the off. images that you saw were a study model that we did. That was a very important model for getting the actual ceiling fabricators on right. board with the project and also understanding what we were trying to right. do, um, which is very difficult to show in any kind of 2D or really even 3D um, models. And then the image, um, the final image of the ceiling um, is the, um, the kind of test bending of um, the framework to establish those curvatures and uh, geometries um, at the fabricator shop. Yeah, Jasmine Construction uh, did the, the installation of the ceiling and they built the ceiling in their, their shop before they brought it here. It was a pretty incredible thing. Um, so the, um, a couple of other kind of special pieces that are inside um, here, one is the, the altar, um, which uh, when we got the project, we were also given um, the papal missal defining the elements of the church that had to be met. And one of them is that um, the altar should be of stone. Uh, although there is a footnoted exception that in North America it could be of wood, but we decided not to read, we never read the footnotes, so we just like read the body of the text. Um, and so we said, well, let's make it out of stone. And we did a number of sketches that were um, trying to work off of the geometry of the, of the church that we'd already established, the conical corner, where um, lines always go from, uh, as they move in section, they go from right angles uh, to curvature. Um, and so the altar really began to play out that as a series of operations that we generated um, digitally and then enlisted the expert help uh, of Quara Stone, who uh, are totally amazing. Um, uh, and they, they, they basically, we thought we were going to build this up out of a bunch of pieces. Uh, it would be assembled in space. And they're like, we'll do that out of one piece. That's so easy. Um, uh, <laughs> Thanks, Lucy. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it was an incredible experience working with them. Um, and we, uh, once we had the kind of model developed, we presented to the, uh, to the design committee as well as the budget. 
and they didn't blink. They were like totally fine. Uh, and then we'd, we'd also designed the two other critical pieces up here, the ambo, which is the podium, uh, and the uh, tabernacle base. And at that time, we had designed this entirely out of wood, and that out of actually a set of steel ribs that were to support the tabernacle. Um, and it was decided that the well, one, they didn't like the steel, they thought it was too cold, so what do we do? So we said, well, why don't we, why don't we think about the altar as a kind of, um, as, as a kind of family of pieces uh, and we developed the geometries that has to have a small table where you can take things out and set it to the side, so the kind of lip that's peeling out. Uh, and then, uh, then we still had this all out of wood, and Father Gilbert um, uh, basically said, you know, the, the relationship is actually much stronger between the altar and the ambo. This is the body of Christ and the word of Christ, and the tabernacle is actually a separate thing, because once you're here, there's nothing there. Um, so I said, well, okay, well, we could make that out of stone too, I guess. Um, and so we did. Uh, and so then I had the pleasure of visiting the quarry to help pick out the stone, which was a really amazing trip, both to see um, the facilities at Quarry Stone and to work with them directly on um, some of the finishing details in terms of, um, um, of honing and finishing um, the surfaces of, of the different pieces. Um, so the images that I think that you see now is the, the site of the quarry that, that all of this came from. Um, we had some stone samples that were sent to us early on which allowed us to, um, to gain approval and select the, the quality of stone that we wanted. Um, and we picked a, um, a dolomitic limestone with a kind of grayish tone. It's, it picks up a lot of the warm tones too and took that little sample out to, um, out to the quarry. Uh, with me and worked with the folks at Cora to kind of walk through the um, the edge of the water very carefully to get to the um, the side of the stone and and select things there. And one of the members from the from the hospital design committee came on that trip as well to kind of approve the slabs um, that were selected for the carving. And then the images that you'll see coming up are some images of in process. Um, you'll see that the altar was um, carved upside down, um, kind of carving out the, um, the belly of, of the altar. And then um, one of the things that was really amazing to see at Porous Stone is that while um, they've got amazing robotic facilities, they also have master stone craftsmen. And all of these are hybrids between that. They go through both processes. These are not just digital outcomes, but really require the expertise of people who work with stone with their hands um, to get the final finishes as well. Right. And I don't know if this will work or not. We're gonna try to show a video of um, Cora installing, of setting the altar. So we're gonna, yeah. it looks like it's running. Yeah. Um, really blow the bandwidth with, with these, but right. so far so good. <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. And you know that we, we had dinner with, with, with these guys at the end of the day and um, the kind of stories about, or the, the, the knowledge of placing um, the foam pieces, the soft pieces on here as not to blow out any of these very beautifully sharp edges um, was a real skill as well. So it wasn't just the fabricators and the stones craftsmen, but the, the folks that got these here and set them were all um, incredibly knowledgeable about stone and how, it, um, how to work with it. There's a, once Jen went out and, and did the stone selection and then once the, the stone was in process, the fabrication was going, uh, I took the office out for a, a kind of all day lunch and learn uh, and we saw the pieces in progress. Um, and one of the things that had happened is the, the original cutting of this piece, um, the, the bit on the robot exploded uh, and it jumped and it knocked the huge corner off of it. So this is actually the second one. And the, the first one became a kind of test piece. And it was in process. Um, and the, the tooling on it was really beautiful, particularly at, um, at the edges. And afterwards, come up and take a look. But we decided to, uh, in the final one, even leave the tooling on the edge of the curve where it starts to come in. Yeah, and then we decided not to finish um, in any kind of uh, fine way the interior of the ambo. Uh, and you can see the stepping of the, the tooling on it. Uh, but the curvature becomes something that um, we thought that this was the one piece where anyone could come and you probably stand and you have the tendency of wanting to kind of grab hold of something that you'd feel the, the tooling right at that moment um, and then the smooth on this side. So two more elements to go. Um, briefly, the dichroic, back to the dichroic. Um, as Craig already mentioned, we kind of 
we stole a little bit of a southern corner over there so we could really get some um, direct sunlight into the space and specifically direct sunlight through the dichroic because that's when it's its most spectacular. Um, you get some of the sense of its um, really magical qualities even at night because you can kind of, it looks like a mirror sometimes and it still looks like glass and it has this capacity of, of duality that's quite beautiful. Um, but the development of that window um, was um, was set by the challenge that um, even though we had worked with Guardian on the sputter coating process, um, those processes were not yet commercially available, so we had to work with um, films. These are uh, 3M films. And at the moment, they only come in two colors, even though each one has a bunch of colors um, that it um, produces. Um, so what, what we did is we looked at, um, we went old school and drew sections and sun angles for the summer and the winter. Um, and started working on the angles of the different pieces um, of the two colors. And so in the diagram, one of the two is represented in the orange and the other in the kind of green tone that you'll see. Um, and the goal was to orient them related to each other and at angles such that um, in both the summer and the winter, there would be sun um, penetrating both a combination of the two colors as well as both colors independently to try to um, produce more color out of the two um, films that were available. Um, and this um, was a really challenging thing to represent or to even know how to study because it is so uh, reliant on sunlight to really see those qualities. So we struggled with it for a while trying to, trying to render it or trying to show it in 2D. Um, um, but, um, but it's really its most spectacular when you can see it in person. Um, and so in the process of the kind of fundraising um, and so on, we, we they asked for the drawings and the renderings and there was just no way so we just sent the, the renderings with some samples so that people could hold the samples and just look at them and understand what the capacity might be um, which worked really well it ended up that um, a nurses group sponsored this um, in honor of a colleague of theirs who passed away um, during the process of the chapel so this is now a kind of um, piece in honor of um, a nurse who um, dedicated her her career here at the hospital um, the images are showing some from the inside, some from the outside. Um, we tried to keep the de detailing quite minimal, so um, these glasses are gravity set. They're not um, held in a mechanical or any kind of um, um, siliconed way. Um, we did have to um, go through the punch list and ask them not to use blue foam <laughs> pieces at the bottom of all the plate because even with the spectacular dichroic that was showing, um, so that was the only real detail that <laughs> this had. And um, the first day we showed up, there was like blue and black and white and red and <laughs> said, can we just do white? <laughs> um, so all of that is resolved now. Um, but the image on the right shows um, really one of the first days where the sun kind of fully came out after it was installed, which was very, really, really exciting. The first week or two that it was installed, it was kind of cloudy and it was sort of glowing purple. And we thought, oh, we hope it has more color right. than purple <laughs> after all of that. And then the sun came out and it was really a um, space bar. Nope. Oh. Nope. Sure. I'm going to try the video. This one's not working. Here we go. Um, and so we also have a time lapse video <laughs> that hopefully yeah. will load. Here when we go. Jen says that it was kind of glowing purple for the, it was really probably the first month that <laughs> it was installed, and we Getting were all nervous. a little bit disappointed. <laughs> but we also um, hadn't calibrated the fact with all of our meetings and site visits were early in the morning here through the whole project, and of course the sun is over here, not on it, and so it's just getting indirect light, and then. Uh, one of the uh, design committee members came and sent us a photograph uh, at like two in the afternoon and the explosion of the of the kind of reflectivity on the curvature uh, and on the the tabernacle was amazing <laughs> we just had never calibrated the fact that we hadn't been there when the sun was actually on the window that was a time lapse that was shot about two weeks ago uh, maybe a week ago that was um uh, during uh, a fairly sunny day, but there was a lot of cloud movement. So you're seeing the kind of um, the pattern of that cloud move across. Uh, but probably from about 12.30 uh, or 11.30 to probably about 4.30 in the afternoon um, where that movement is occurring. And then you're probably getting tired. Uh, the last thing we wanted to talk about was actually the door that's in motion right now. Um, and when I said that there's a lot of gray hairs that came out of this project, this was one of them. So this was something that we always had 
in the design pretty much from day one, this kind of idea of a grand door. And um, Father Gilbert, who was the, the, space, the liturgical space consultant for the, for the hospital, um, was, uh, I think every meeting we talked about the door referencing the uh, cast bronze doors at the LA Cathedral uh, in Mineo's project. And, uh, you know, so we immediately looked those up. They were $3 million when it was done, just for the doors. Um, and we're like, yeah, uh, probably not doing bronze. The doors were the same budget we had for this whole project. Right, right. So, the, uh, so we, worked through, we went through a number of iterations and had some struggles, um, both with getting uh, a fabricator to kind of be willing to take it on for anything reasonable. Um, and there was even a moment when we had explored, um, uh, we had talked to Quora about carving the door out of the stone, uh, but trying to use it in a different stone to try to get it thin enough where we might get some light through it. Um, and it set off an unbelievable flurry of emails uh, from Lincoln and the guys at, um, at Quora who were like, this is a research project, we could do this. They were sending us like historic doors, stone doors, like giant pivot stone hinges. We were like, and we, we were so into it, and we, they were like, How we, I'm pretty sure we could do it for your budget, and we presented it to the design meeting, and they were like, stone door? You mean like a mausoleum? <laughs> and the air in the room just went <laughs> So we, but we like our door. <laughs> the stone is, an, is another project that we're still gonna try to work on. But the, the door, um, so we, we worked with, um, Actually, a couple who are graduates of your program and graduates of our program, uh, mm -hmm. Synecdoche Design, Adam Smith and Lisa Sauvé, uh, and they did the fabrication for us. Uh, a couple of hiccups in this whole process. Um, so uh, interior swinging doors to meet ADA accessibility need to move with, um, uh, need to operate with no more than five pounds of force. Um, we had found the hinge manufacturer who decided they couldn't guarantee that it was gonna move for that force, given the weight of the door and the strange kind of design, which they couldn't quite calibrate. Um, we went around and around and around, and then finally found a loophole in the door of the, uh, it's, a, it's a rotating door, not a standard pivoting interior, swinging interior door. It doesn't have a, it has a closer um, uh, built into the hinge. Uh, and uh, I forgot what the other loophole was, but we got the um, Randy Abramson at the city of Livonia is like, ah, no problem, it's no problem. Like, but it is the exit door for the chapel. It's like one of the two, it's, it swings, right? Like, yes, it does. <laughs> uh, he approved it. So um, we moved forward. Um, what you'll notice now is you can probably operate that door by just blowing on it. It is so soft in terms of its movement. But the number of nights of kind of sweat of dealing with this company in the Netherlands who decided they didn't want to return our calls um, to tell us the kind of weight of the door or what we could do to the door, how we could reduce its weight to get the action to work. In the end, it turned out pretty uh, fantastic. And the, the intent of the design was twofold. One, we wanted a kind of major and minor part of it. So the asymmetrical pivot was also a kind of challenge for them. But the other thing we wanted the door to begin to set up some of the language of the ceiling. Uh, and then we used um, a different wood there, it's walnut, which picks up the, all of the elements that are up here in the front. So the top of the ambo and the cap for the tabernacle are also walnut, while everything else is cherry. Um, and then we wanted a kind of um, really nice handle. Uh, and so uh, the kind of leather wrap on the steel that goes up and down uh, is important. The other thing that we wanted to do was, uh, as the door moves, produce a kind of dynamism of effect. So the, the, the slats actually get thicker as they get to the horizontal member of the embedded cross. Um, and so when they move, uh, the, the gap of light in between starts to shift uh, and change. Uh, and so there's a kind of moray, essentially, that starts to emerge uh, in the movement of the door. Huh? You Jen did a second ago, but you I think we're on the closing side, yeah. so we can set everyone free. But the closing side, which I'll leave it on, is just a, another reminder and nod to all of the people who worked really hard on this project yeah. um, and were part of this broader team, not just Ply Plus, but um, liturgical space um, support and structures and, and engineers and all the way through. So we'll just leave that up so you can see. Um, the list of um, companies okay. and individuals who right. um, came together to help make this happen. Right.
So thank you very much. We're going to invite Bill to help us with questions or <laughs> wandering around and taking a look at things um, more, more closely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. One thing Craig uh, neglected to acknowledge with the door is that door was mostly fabricated by the time we realized that the hinge might happen. Oh, that's true. It's that's true. true. So we thought it was going to be the garage door for a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's true. It was pretty much done. I'm sure there's many other things you could correct in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's important to know that that door was pretty much built yeah. sitting in the shop. Any questions, or we can do questions or on the round as well. Right. <laughs> Anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> I looked first. Um, you didn't speak about that. I guess this is the east-facing window. Um, um, I was wondering. Uh, the strategy behind that, we talked a lot about the, the south facing one. You might be able to see it tonight. The east facing um, was a way to bring in light for the early morning mass um, because that's the only moment that has a very specific um, schedule and timing to it. Um, and, and so in some ways, this is really the window for all of the um, chapel attendees who've been coming here for years. And I don't know that the color shows very darkly, but the no. ceiling of it um, is painted a very, very light blue as a, a Marian color because it also had the significance related to um, the direction and, um, and um, Marian imagery. So it's, it's got a little bit of the kind of cool tones of the morning. And so it picks up the Mary part of the St. Mary's Chapel as well. Uh, beautiful work. Thanks for sharing it with us. Uh, I just, there was some references you gave classically and then some references I'm sure that your design committee came to you with, Moneo's LA Church <laughs> as one. But there's one, and I just sort of picked up on this today, that I, I might be asking you if it is a source, but um, Elil Saarinen's Columbus, Indiana, first, first Christian church, where the southern light that glows up on the altar, is mm. that? And then the vertical windows, were you guys looking at that as a reference, or is that something I'm just picking up out of, out of the air? Uh, it wasn't something we looked at. I've, I've, I've been there, but um, probably and, 25 years ago. And what other references, that was my other question, what other, what other people, what other works were you looking at? We, um, we didn't study that one in particular. We were looking at some of um, Alto's work and just in terms of how to resolve the ceiling. So I, th I think the broader answer is that we were looking at a range of projects that weren't all necessarily chapels um, along the way sure. to try to figure out um, geometric relationships or trying to figure out, um, I don't know, ideas about how light and geometry, you know, this corner, we couldn't be sure. And for the most part, it does kind of um, hold the light of the dichroic window along that. So we, um, it's hard to say specific projects, also because it was happening so quickly. Um, but it, it does feel very much like one of those things where when you're moving so quickly, you're sort of remembering things that you've, you've looked at or studied, maybe even sometimes a long time ago, and, yeah. and working them through the process of development. Yeah. Um, but we didn't do like formal case studies per se. We were just kind no. of constantly looking for ideas and, and help figuring out the things we were struggling with. Yeah, I'd say that's true. It was interesting, the, the committee told us that they, 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 this is not the first time that the hospital has undertaken the idea that they needed uh, to upgrade that chapel. Um, and we were told about a previous um, exercise that they went through um, where the, um, the architects, um, which I don't think they ever even told us who they were, we're bringing in uh, lots of pictures and lots of images and trying to develop a kind of palette of things. And the committee actually decided that that wasn't so helpful for them, that, that what they were, um, they were more interested in kind of relationships than they were kind of existing projects. And so I think we kind of downplayed that a little bit when we were talking to them, except for some of the things which were 
kind of obvious in terms of their inspiration, like the Baroque, um, in terms of our thinking, uh, but ob ones that obviously they weren't imagining that that's what we were going to give them uh, as a particular look. So it, it was an interesting process, and they were. Uh, Father Gilbert teaches uh, architecture studio at UD Mercy, um, and he kind of led that committee through an educational process before we ever got um, got to meet them. So they were pretty astute and pretty um, sharp in terms of what they were asking for from us, um, and what they were trying to, um, I guess, kind of lead us toward. But not uh, any. They did. They kind of were kind of pushing us away from giving them kind of really specific images to respond to in that way. Yeah, just a group of terrific design critics, just through conversation. And that's where those weekly meetings were essential to what this project is, just constantly working through and talking about what it was becoming. It was, I mean, those, those meetings, I would say another thing that we learned, because we also got really tired of those meetings at a certain <laughs> point, because it was like every Monday, and it was Monday, so that meant <laughs> Sunday was like, your weekend was gone, um, uh, and it was exhausting. But w what we realized when the when it came down to those moments when decisions had to be made about um, what we could do and what we couldn't afford to do and how we might change something, mm -hmm. the committee understood the importance of the whole thing. They kind of got the design uh, because they had kind of lived it with us. It wasn't like, oh, here's a box. You know, what do you think? Um, they'd kind of I think they had ownership in it all the way through. And so the couple of moments when they stood up for the budget or they stood up for that's not the thing that you can cut uh, was totally amazing. And so we're actually, we're now trying to do that with projects um, as we've moved forward, it's kind of difficult as it can be, but we're, we're trying now to, through, particularly through that early design phase of like really quick regular meetings where they're seeing it um, almost in animation kind of develop uh, rather than here's a finished thing. So they might have been a drop selling. <laughs> uh, you may have just answered my question in the last session, but maybe there, you have a little more to add. I just wanted to ask a question about the relationship between geometry and cost. Uh, Bill, you want to talk about this one? <laughs> I, 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 what you said probably, you know, just about the working through the process. You know, be part of that answer, but as I look around, there's hardly a flat surface in this. Sorry, we're there. How did you negotiate when, when there was pushback about um, budget or cost to, to, to be able to maintain some of the more complex geometries? Mm -hmm. You want to take that first step? Sure, sure. You need a, you need a mic. Oh, here. Okay. Do we have one here? Not for I don't know if it's the same or if that's the... So uh, the perception is geometry is expensive. And uh, we fought tooth and nail. It was almost a running joke that if we didn't fight, that this would just be a square box with some punch windows in it. That's what every contractor generally wants to do. So um, having a client that understood what we are trying to accomplish. And I think the rigors of the digital modeling kind of demystified some of the complexities. Uh, there's some great examples with the brick, uh, where the way the contractor priced it, there were sort of four pricing categories. There was mm -hmm. the regular speed, the slow speed, the specially slow speed, and uh, it's going to take forever to do it, speed. And so working back and forth with the masons, we were able to sort of limit the areas of the super complex, and it, it really kind of did demystify some of those complexities. And in actuality, the brick yeah. came in 30% on the budget right. from the initial, and in spite of all of its complexities. So um, I think the key is that we have to work with the guys that are going to do the work. And if we get that opportunity to sit down with them and explain how it's actually happening, then they bring their creativity to the table and, and take it right. the rest of the distance. Uh, we played a game quite frequently. We call it spin the model where we'd come in with a digital model and put it up on a screen and get the sub that are going to be doing the work and show them exactly what the rationale is and the whys. Yeah. And assume, like the ceiling, you know, the complexity of the ceiling, if you can imagine, where do you start? How do you lay one of these out? Just 
be able to give a reference for the second one. So once they understood where those points were, they were they said, "Oh, this is easy. We can do this." Yeah. And so that's how that's how complex geometries can be affordable, more affordable. Mm -hmm. There were yeah. subtle changes too that we went through a series of testing and spacing. So this is more open than we originally wanted it. So there was a lot of kind of subtle changes that we did make and things that we gave up in order to kind of keep the larger element in place. Um, a lot of simplifications, but, um, but probably some of them also benefiting the project. Mm -hmm. the, the, the engineering, the value engineering process, um, there were some hard fought battles, um, but there were also, um, there were also our outcomes that made the project better in the end. So a, a typical design bid build model seems like it would not work well for what, what you're talking about because you wouldn't have those conversations with this project done differently or how, just to be able to... Uh, it was construction manager, like running it. So it was, you know, they had the, the job, they had um, uh, pre-construction services as part of their contract. So working with us all that way through, they were compensated and they were bringing the trades to us. Sometimes we were sneaking around them to get to the trades in a couple of places, but um, for the most part, um, yeah, it, 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 it might have been very different as a traditional uh, yeah, bid, build, bid, design, bid, build. Yeah, the danger in that delivery system is you don't know what the cost is until after you're way down the rabbit hole with the design. Right. Yeah. So I want to thank you guys. Oh. Um, I want you to move away from there so I can feel and repeat that thing. Okay. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> the noise cool. that you guys are hearing outside is the rain that's coming down, so you yeah. might want to hang out for a few minutes, and I'm sure these guys would be happy to point out things or if you were looking around and why is this like this, or I like this. You guys would like to hear, sure. I like this, sure. right? So if there's a detail that you really enjoy or there's something that you're not sure how it works and why it's the way it is, I'm sure these guys are going to hang out for a few more minutes and we can at least wait for the rain to finish. Um, so we'd love your feedback on how you guys thought this format went tonight. Yeah, well. how'd that go? You can do that. You can send that to me. And I just want to, again, thank these guys for taking a risk with us tonight and sharing this amazing project with us. Thank you, guys. Well, thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's such an amazing thing. Thank you guys. Like Carl said, he and I have talked forever about like a lecture series that was just architects presenting one building. Um, I got kicked off. I got kicked off of our lecture exhibitions committee because that was my broken record. <laughs> but it was. Thanks. Thanks for having us. Yes. Yes.